Great tense, how are you doing? <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Pumi and I'd like to welcome you to Mindset Learn Extra. It is of course the exam revision show and I'm very happy and excited to be part of this. It is of course proudly sponsored by MTN SA Foundation and endorsed by the Department of Basic Education. Now Mindset is today in studio, I am joined by our awesome teacher. It is of course Mr. Martin. Hello Martin. Hi there Pumi. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Hi, um, Mindsetters. So, Martin, tell us, what are we going to be learning about today? Okay, so today's show, Mindsetters, is a very, very important section of your grade 10 syllabus. Those are the financial statements of sole traders. Awesome stuff. You know what, Ma uh, Martin, I haven't done economics, and I think this is the best time for me to learn, right? I mean, right. it's, it's accounting. Yep, so it's accounting. this is the start of everything, you know, in grade 10. That's when learners really get to understand what accounting is. And is it the best time for me to learn for the very first time or? I think it's the best time for okay. you to learn, Bumi. And it's the best time mindset is as well. Your exams are coming up and we're doing a section that's very, very important. And we're doing a section that forms the groundwork for what you'll be doing in grade 11 and carrying on in grade 12. Whoopi, I'm very excited. Guys, please make sure that you grab yourself a glass of water because I have my right next to me so during the show make sure that you also drop me all of the questions that you have based on financial statement so that I can ask Martin all of the questions that we have so during the show I will try and talk to him and see if we don't have if we have enough time to tackle all of them but right now guys without any further talking let us just get straight to learning Martin? okay th thank you very much Pumi and mindset is welcome to our lesson on financial statements of sole traders and what we're really going to be focusing on today is the two items that I've written here for you we need to understand mainly how to do these year-end adjustments those are vitally vitally important in fact I can't stress how important they are because those adjustments are going to come back in grade 11 and they're going to come back in grade 12 and you're going to end up having to do them at university as well as when you run your own business one day you're going to be after doing those year-end adjustments so we're going to do that and today we're going to pay particular reference to the income statement you will know from your accounting that there are two financial statements that we prepare at the end of a financial year i'm going to tell you which two they are in a moment think about them so long and see if you can get them before i tell you which ones they are but today is particular reference to our income statement also we need to just understand the main concepts relating to the matching principle in accounting so you'll know that there are various GARP principles that we have to understand and use and one of them is called the matching principle I'd like somebody if you know the answer what the matching principle is send us what the answer is on Facebook and I'll tell you later on if anybody knows what the matching principle is so without further ado let's get to our challenge question for the day for those of you that are watching the show for the first time, we usually ask a challenge question at the beginning of the show where you have to try and work out what the answer is to the question, and I will answer the question later on at the very end. Today's challenge question is, how would you journalize the following end of year adjustment? And it says, T. Majola, a debtor, was declared insolvent. So you need to know what insolvency means. I'm sure you know that already. And T. Majola owned us. We are called Wallaby Traders. He owed us an amount of 800 Rand. A dividend of 30 cents in the Rand was received, and the balance of the account is to be written off. That's your challenge question for today, Mindsetters. Tell me which account or accounts are going to be debited and tell me which account or accounts are going to be credited. Send us the answer on Facebook, write into us, and I'll tell you what the correct answer is at the end of the show. Now, when you are doing year-end adjustments, what we need to be aware of is that every business has got a financial year-end. That is called the end of the financial year, and for many businesses, it's usually on the 28th of February, but that can vary. Any business can choose when its financial year is going to end. Normally businesses choose the 28th of February because that is the time that corresponds with the government's national budget. For those of you that are doing maybe economics or business studies, you'll know that the government delivers a national budget on the 28th of, or in February every year to close off its accounts on the 28th of February. So many businesses do that to have their tax year coincide with the government's financial year. And what we do at the end of this financial year, we prepare 
two different financial statements. I asked you a few minutes ago which ones they were. The first one is our income statement, and the income statement is prepared in order to calculate our net profit, or if our business is doing very badly, our net loss for the year. So we prepare this income statement, and what we do is we take all our incomes, subtract all our expenses, and that's going to give us our profit. Any business would want to know whether we make a profit or a loss at financial year end. The second important one is that we prepare a balance sheet, and the balance sheet shows our financial position. You will often hear the balance sheet by a different name. It's also often called the statement of financial position. And that is because it shows us in our business what our business's financial position is. It basically shows us the accounting equation at the end of the financial year. I'm sure you remember the accounting equation from this year's studies and maybe grade nine. The accounting equation is our assets are equal to our owner's equity plus our liabilities. And what the balance sheet does is it shows this in a table form. It tells us these are how many assets we have, these are how many liabilities we have, and this is our owner's equity. And at the end, the two figures have to show the same because our assets are equal to our owner's equity plus our liabilities. Then we say that our books are balanced because our assets are shown to be equal to our equity plus our liabilities. Very, very important. Now, in case you're wondering what goes into these two statements, in the income statement, we are only going to include our income accounts and our expense accounts. Where are incomes and expenses usually shown? They're shown in a specific section of the general ledger. They are shown in the nominal section of the general ledger. So basically what we can say is that our income statement always contains our incomes and our expenses. In other words, it contains everything in the nominal section of our general ledger. As for the balance sheet, that shows the remaining accounts that we have. It shows our assets, it shows our liabilities, it shows our capital, and it shows our drawings. Those are the four items that are shown in the balance sheet. And in case this isn't making sense to you, think back to your general ledger and think back to the other section, not the nominal section, but the section that we call the balance sheet section. Yes, that's right. All the accounts in the balance sheet section are the ones that are going to be shown in our balance sheet. Also, please bear in mind that these two financial statements have now got new names. In terms of the New Companies Act, what they've done is they've changed their names from an income statement to a statement of comprehensive income. So I'll just write that for you. It's sometimes called a statement of comprehensive income. So if you see that anywhere, don't get a fright. It's exactly the same as our income statement. It's just got a new name. And the balance sheet has also been renamed. We now call the balance sheet a statement of our financial position. So if you see anything called a statement of financial position, just know that that's more terminology for a balance sheet. Now, very important what we do at year end. We show all our incomes and all our expenses in our income statement or our statement of comprehensive income. But what is vitally important, and this is why we do year end adjustments, is that we want to show in our income statement all the income that we have earned this year and all the expenses that we have incurred this year, regardless of whether we've received the money or whether we've paid the money. So in other words, if I've got a telephone account for February and my financial year ends in February, but I've used the phone during February and I get from Telcom or from any other service provider, I get my telephone account. What's going to happen is I'm going to look at that telephone account and that money, even if I haven't paid it by the 28th of February, that money must be recorded as an expense in this year because we used the telephone in February. So in other words, our income statement must reflect the incomes and the expenses that happened in this financial year, regardless of whether we've received the money or paid the money for them or not. So those are called year-end adjustments. Year-end adjustments are the changes that we make to the figures so that they reflect the correct values for this financial year. So we're going to include things that we have um, 
earned, any income that we've earned but we haven't yet received the money for, we must include in this year's income statement because we have earned the income in this year. In the same way, if we've done something that's cost us money and that happened in this financial year, then we have to include those expenses in this financial year. So that is the answer to the question earlier about the matching principle. I'll give you a statement exactly what the matching principle means just now, because I want to see if somebody can answer, give us a proper definition of it on, on Facebook. But that's a little hint on how to answer my question about the matching principle. So there are usually some important adjustments that you need to know. And you will get most of these in a final exam. You will get different types of adjustments, usually between 10 or 15 adjustments in a question. And most of them you can put into one of these categories that I've put in here. So you need to know how to do your trading stock deficit or your trading stock surplus. That comes up very often when you, they give you the physical stock take amount, you've got to be able to compare it to your trading stock figure and see whether there's a deficit or whether there's a surplus. So make sure you revise how to do that adjustment. Very similar to that one is the consumable stores on hand adjustment. These two always go together in a question that shows the following. It usually starts with a physical stock take showed. So when we're talking about a physical stock take, it tells us what our inventory is, how much trading stock we have, and how many consumable stores we have left over at the end of the financial year. And the adjustment will tell you that there was a physical stock take done and that the following were on hand. When you see that, you need to know how to deal with it and what to do. I'll show you an example of this just now when we work through our exam question. The next important thing that you need to know is how to write off a bad debt or how to record your bad debts recovered. Remember, these items are adjustments where you've got a debtor that doesn't pay, or later on the debtor comes back and pays you a bad debt that you'd written off, you thought you'd never see him again, and he comes back and pays you his money. You need to know how to record that, because very often at the end of the financial year, they're going to give you a question involving a bad debt. And our challenge question for the day actually involved a bad debt, if you've been trying that so far. I'll show you how to do it at the end of the show. The next one that's important is knowing how to deal with your bank charges, your stop orders, and your debit orders. These are all things that you're going to see on the bank statement, extra payments that were made this month that you have to record that you don't know about. And usually you can remember that all of these items need to go in the CPJ, so what's going to happen is they're going to affect bank in some way. Bank is going to decrease because we're paying money. And whatever we're paying the money for, we're going to show that as an expense usually in our income statement. Then the next four adjustments are very, very important. And you will typically get a question containing all four of them. They're the same types of adjustments. They just work in opposite ways. So our first one is accrued income. Accrued income is income that we've earned, but that we haven't yet received. So we've done something to earn that money, but the person hasn't paid us that money yet. When you see an accrued income, you need to know how to deal with it. You'll remember that that gets added to the relevant income, and that will be shown as accrued income in trade and other receivables. But I'll show you an example of that just now. Next thing that we have is the opposite of accrued income. This is income that's been received in advance. All I'm going to do is swap those two words around. Income received in advance is income that we've received, but that we have not yet earned. So somebody has paid us the money for something it's income received but not yet earned let me just erase that and write it properly income received but not yet earned so the person has given us the money but we still have to do the service. So this is like somebody who paid his rent in advance. We still have to let that person live in our, in our building or occupy our premises. Then accrued expenses and prepaid expenses are the opposite to these. Accrued expenses are not yet paid. They're expenses that you haven't paid yet. So they have to be added to the relevant expense. And the opposite of this is prepaid expenses. These are expenses that have been paid in advance for the next financial year. 
So you need to understand how to identify those and how to deal with them, how to record them. When we work through our exam practice, I'm going to show you how to do that. Then, another one that you may or may not have done in class, it's really covered in detail in grade 11, and that is how to work out depreciation on an asset. I'm not going to cover that today, but make sure you know how to do it if your teacher has done it with you in class already. You'll do it in way more detail in grade 11. And then, a very important one that you need to know is how to calculate interest. You need to know how to calculate interest that's still owing on a loan, or you need to calculate interest that is still owed to you on a fixed deposit. Those are those timeline calculations where you work out different percentages. Make sure you practice enough of those examples so that you can go into your final exam confidently and accurately and be able to answer these questions well. And then finally, you need to know the closing transfers. The closing transfers are also very important. When I speak about closing transfers, I just mean what we do at financial year end, specifically subtracting debtors' allowances from your sales account. So that should always be the very first thing you do. You take sales and you minus debtors' allowances on the front of your income statement. Finally, what's important here, just another tip, is that you cannot, cannot, cannot do these questions unless you know the format of the notes and the income statement very, very well. You need to study where every note goes. You need to know what everything is because so many, many of these questions can be answered just like, almost like a jigsaw puzzle. What you do is you get given a number and you must take that figure and put it in the correct place in the income statement or on the balance sheet. So you need to know the format of your notes and you need to know particularly interest income, which is note one, interest expense, which is note two, inventory, which is note four, then we have trade and other receivables, note five, cash and cash equivalents, note six, Owner's Equity, Note 7, and Trade and Other Payables, Note 8. I have left out Note 3. I know that Note 3 is the note on fixed assets, which often we don't cover in Grade 10, but perhaps your teacher has taught that to you. If not, um, don't worry about it right now. You'll do it in Grade 11. But I think before we tackle the exam question, I think it's about time for a break now. Absolutely. Thank you, Martin. All right, then, Grade 10, let's take a quick break. We'll see you shortly after this break. Welcome back, my setters, from that very short break. Um, it is now time we get more learning and extra right here on Mindset. We are still doing the exam revision. So please make sure that you drop all of the questions that you have so that Martin and I can see how we can get to answer them. Martin, are you ready for the next session? Yes, I am. Awesome stuff. Thanks very much, Pumi, and welcome back, Mindsetters. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at a typical exam question. This is one, it's quite an old question. It was from the 2006 Department of Education exam. But to be honest, the basic principles stay the same even eight years ago. They're still the same as today. And what What's going to happen is we're going to read the information and try and make the different adjustments. It says Peggy Perumal owns a ladies dress shop. I think this is, might be something that would appeal to the ladies in the audience. It's a ladies dress shop called Peggy's Fashions and her bookkeeper has drafted an income statement for the year ended 28th of February 2005. So we've been given a draft income statement. So the bookkeeper has prepared it. But she has not taken certain adjustments into account. So basically, she's prepared this income statement, but the income statement is incorrect, and it's your job or our job together to try and help her fix the mistakes that have been made or take into account these adjustments. The question says that we must, number one, correct the income statement to reflect the correct profit or loss for the year. It says correct any errors by crossing out the original figures and inserting the correct figures. So what we're going to do is we're going to make our adjustments directly on the income statement that has been prepared. There is a second part to this question, which is also to prepare a balance sheet. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to do that part of the question now because we said that today we're going to concentrate only on the income statement. So we're going to look at what's going to happen with the income statement when we have to correct the figures that the bookkeeper has put in that are incorrect. But bear in mind that the question is usually a larger question which combines 
lines and income statements on one side and the balance sheet or statements of financial position, which as I've said are the same thing, on the other side. So let's take a look at what we've been given. First of all, we've been given the draft income statement over here. So you can see that she's included a whole bunch of figures over there and there's some space for additional things that she might have left out. Then what we've been given on the next page is we've been given the balance sheet section. So remember, these items in the balance sheet section do not appear in the income statement, but we're going to need those figures firstly to prepare the balance sheet and secondly also to calculate some of our missing figures in the income statement. But I'm going to show you that as we start with some of the adjustments. So just bear in mind that we may have to make adjustments to these figures here as well, even though they are not physically going to be shown in the income statement. Okay, so without further ado, let's get to the first adjustment. Our first adjustment says, Peggy took stock of dresses for her personal use at the cost price of 4,200 Rand. So what she did is she took stock from the shop that instead of selling it, she took it for personal use. When you see the words personal use, that should always ring some alarm bells because you know that when it's personal use, we've got a special rule in accounting that says that the owner and the business, their finances are always separated. When you see the word personal use, you know that drawings is going to be involved. So what this owner did is she took stock out of the business for her personal use. We know that she's made a drawing. And when you account for a drawing, this is something that you should know how to do in the general journal. You are going to record the drawing, and on the other side, you're going to make whatever the owner took out from the business go down in value. If the owner took money out, we're going to make bank go down in value. If the owner took stationery out, stationery is going to decrease. If the owner took equipment out, equipment is going to decrease. In this example, what is it that she took? She took stock of dresses. So we know that what has to happen in this adjustment is that trading stock has to be affected. And we know that trading stock is going to decrease. This adjustment comes up often when the owner takes stock for personal use. And what they're testing you here is that you know that the owner takes the stock at the cost price. If I'm the owner of the business, I'm not going to take my stock at the selling price. I'm not going to make a profit on buying dresses from my own shop. That would be really, really pointless because I can get the dresses at cost price because it's my business anyway. So they've given us, luckily here, the cost price of 4,200 Rand. So we don't need to calculate anything. But bear in mind that when you see this particular adjustment, very often you're going to have to use that markup formula that you all know to calculate your cost price. So the adjustment is going to be trading stock is going to decrease and drawings is going to increase and the amount is going to be 4,200 in each case, nothing else that has to be done. Now what we've got to bear in mind is that this adjustment doesn't have to do with the income statement at all because trading stock doesn't appear in the income statement and drawings doesn't appear in the income statement. However, as I'm going to show you later on, it's very important that we keep track of these adjustments because there could come an adjustment later on that needs this piece of information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here to where my balance sheet accounts are. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my drawings figure. You see here it is as 44,000. I'm just going to write there that it's not 44,000, but actually 44,000 plus 4,200 because the owner has now drawn additional stock. Normally it's a good idea to open a bracket and then close the brackets at the end of the uh, question to work out the final answer. In the same way, there's a problem here with trading stock. This figure of 180,000 is not correct because that is before the adjustment we've just done has been taken into account. So what I must do is I must take my trading stock of 180,000 and because the owner has taken out 4,200 rands worth of stock, I'm going to subtract 4,200 rand from that in my trading stock account. I'll show you why this is important later on, but right now we're not going to make any changes to the income statement. Okay, so that was our first adjustment. Our second adjustment here is number two. And it tells me that a stock count, this is the same as a physical stock, take, a stock count, at the year end revealed dresses of 170,000 Rand on hand. So when you see this adjustment, 
you know that you're doing a physical stock take. You might have seen, if you sometimes walk through a shopping center or somewhere, they, are cl they close off a music shop where people are counting their CDs to try and do a physical stock take. Or they close off a bookstore, people are doing stock taking on their books. What they do then is they count every single item of stock that they have on the premises and they compare it to the figure that they have in their books to determine whether or not something has maybe gone lost, been stolen, or something like that. So what you do when you see an adjustment like this, you compare the stock take value with what we call the book value. So in our books, we must now look and see how much trading stock we think we have, and we need to check whether there's any physical stock that's actually gone missing. So let's look back at the balance sheet. So you can see here that we started the year with 180, or sorry, we ended the year with 180,000 rands worth of trading stock. Now normally people might just say, okay, there's 180,000 rands worth of trading stock, and I did a physical stock take, and I counted only 170,000 rands worth of trading stock, so obviously there's 10,000 rands worth of stock that's gone missing. Yes, it's true, there is a trading stock deficit, but it is not 10,000 rand. Reason being that this previous adjustment here, where the owner took 4,200 rand, that needs to be taken into account first before we can work out what our actual trading stock deficit is. So that's why it's very important to calculate the right book value of the trading stock. It's not this 180,000, it's actually 180,000 minus 4,200. So let's work that out on the calculator. The trading stock figure that we should actually have is 180,000. Let's get that calculator on the screen. One eighty thousand Okay, let's try that again. One eighty thousand minus 4,200 rands worth of trading stock that was taken by the owner for her personal use. The answer that I get here is 175,800. So we've been able to account for the 4,200 that the owner took. So in fact, we've got 175,800 rands worth of trading stock after that adjustment has taken place. So now if we have to calculate our trading stock deficit, we can see here that in our books, our trading stock is actually 175,000 800 rand, not 180,000, because adjustment number one reduces our trading stock value by 4,200 so that it becomes 175,800. And we're going to minus our stock take value of 170,000. So we thought we had 175,800. When we counted it, we saw we had 170,000, which means that there is a deficit of 175,800 minus 170,000 gives me the answer of 5,800 rand. So what we know is that our stock has gone missing. There's stock to the value of 5,800 rand that somehow is gone. We don't know if it was lost, if it was stolen, if it was destroyed. The fact just remains that there's 5,800 rand less worth of stock than we thought we actually had. So to make this entry, what we're going to do, we're going to actually show that on the income statement. So here's my income statement over here. You need to know that trading stock deficit is a special expense that we create at the end of the financial year. So I'm going to write it in here, trading stock deficit. And the trading stock deficit is simply going to be that figure of 5,800 Rand that I've just calculated. So make sure you understand where the trading stock deficit goes. It's the unexplained loss of trading stock to the value of 5,800. If it had been the other way around, if somehow we had more trading stock than we thought we had, then we would record it up at the top here under other operating income. We would record it as a trading stock surplus, and that would be money that we got extra, it would have been an income. Also, what we should do is if we're doing the balance sheets at the same time, what we should do is we should go to our balance sheets adjustment and you can literally just cross out the figure of 180,000 and replace it with 170,000 because you've counted it. You know that that's how much trading stock you actually have on hand at the physical stock take at the end of the year. Make sure you know how to do that adjustment that comes up again and again and again. Okay, let's look at adjustment number three. Adjustment number three says, 
A computer was purchased on credit on the 31st of December for 8,000 Rand. This has not been recorded, and the amount due will be paid in March 2005. This is a relatively straightforward and simple adjustment. All that's happened is that we have now purchased a computer for 8,000 Rand, and we've purchased it on credit. Remember, if you purchase something on credit, what that means is you haven't paid for it yet. You've bought it uh, now, and you're going to pay later on. So all that you need to know is which two accounts are going to be affected here. First of all, we have purchased a computer, and the computer counts as equipment. Remember, all machinery and all, um, sorry, not vehicles, all furniture that you have in the business will count as equipment. So we know that our equipment has to increase by 8,000 Rand because that was the cost price of the computer. Because we haven't paid for it yet, we've purchased it on credit, we also need to increase our creditors' control by another 8,000 Rand. So that's really all that has to happen here. That's the only adjustment that we're going to make. And you should see that both of these accounts are actually not in the income statement. They're both going to appear on the balance sheet. So I'm just going to go back to my balance sheet account, which is here. My equipment, what I must do is not 29,000. It's actually 29,000 Rand plus an additional 8,000, because we haven't recorded that we purchased that equipment yet. And we've got creditors control over here of 35,100. It's not true to say that we owe our creditors 35,100, because we have not yet recorded the 8,000 Rand that we owe them based on the equipment that we've purchased. So the adjustment is easy. Add 8,000 to equipment, add 8,000 to creditors control. Our next adjustment here says that what we have to do is provide for interest owing on the loan. Now this is one that comes up again and again. When you see interest owing on the loan, you usually have to calculate using a timeline how much interest is owing. It's interest owing on the loan from Credfin, and it says that no loan repayments have been made since the loan was originally received in 2003. So we've borrowed this money since 2003. Our financial year is 2005, so we've had that money in our business, uh, owing that money on the loan for two years. What we've got to do is we've got to work out how much interest is owing, and this is actually a simple one because we have not repaid or borrowed any additional money during the year. All it tells us is that 20,000 Rand has to be repaid on the 30th of June, 2005. This is a balance sheet adjustment, the second part, and it falls outside our financial year because that's only going to happen on the 30th of June, and we know that our financial year ends on the 28th of February. So for now, I'm going to ignore that part of the adjustment because that falls outside our financial year. What you do when you see something like this, it's always two steps. The first thing you do is you calculate how much interest you should have paid. And then you compare it to the figure that you have for interest and adjust it appropriately. So if you look here, in our income statement, we've got at the bottom an amount of interest expense of 11,000 Rand. This is the interest that we've recorded to date on the loan. So that's what we have. But the question is asking us to calculate and check whether that figure is right and whether we owe any money, whether we still have anything to pay. So the way we're going to do it is quite easy. If you look at your balance sheet, you're going to see that the loan from Credfin is highlighted at the bottom here. Loan from Credfin. The loan is 13% per annum, and it's an amount of 100 thousand rand. So what we need to do is we need to do the adjustment to work out how much interest we should have paid. We don't need a timeline because the loan didn't change during the year. We didn't pay off anything or we didn't increase the loan. It told us that in the question. So our adjustment is very easy. All we do is we work out the interest we should have paid and the interest we should have paid is it's on a hundred thousand rand. That's the value of my loan and I multiply it by 13 percent. So 13 over a hundred the interest that we should have paid is 13,000 Rand. So that is the interest that the loan cost us. It cost us 13,000 Rand. However, if we look in our income statement, we will see that we've so far only paid 11,000. So this figure of 11,000 Rand is wrong. It should be 13,000. So we started off with 11,000. And 
it should have been 13,000. So that means that there is actually an amount of 2,000 rand that we have not yet paid. It's 2,000 rand that we still owe on this loan. We paid 11,000 and we should have paid 13,000 this year. Please remember what that is called. The 2,000 rand that we have here is actually an accrued expense. So what we're going to do to finish the adjustment, we're adding 2,000 onto my 11,000 to make the number 13,000. That's the correct figure for interest expense this year. And at the same time, we're going to go to our balance sheet and just record that accrued expenses are going up by 2,000 rand because they're still 2,000 rand that's owing on that loan. Please, mind setters, that's a very, very important adjustment. Remember, you can summarize it like this. You work out the interest that you should have paid, and you compare it to the interest that you've already paid in your income statement. You then adjust the figure as necessary to ensure that the figures in your income statement actually match the reality of what that loan cost you this, this year. So I think it's about time for another break, Pumi. Absolutely. How are we doing for time? Awesome stuff. Thank you so much, Martin. Mindsetters, let's take a very quick break. When we come back, we are going to be learning more and learning extra right here in the exam school reversion. Welcome back, my setters, from that very short ad break. We are still doing um, accounting with Martin right here in studio. And please do make sure that you drop all of the questions that you have right here on our Facebook page. If you can also go through our Facebook page, some of you are asking for the notes. We do have the notes, so please log on to our Facebook page. It is www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra. That is where you will find all of the notes that we are going through right now. Martin, I'm ready. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you very much, Pumi, and welcome back, everyone. We um, did the first four adjustments, and I've seen that the fifth adjustment is an adjustment that affects the balance sheet only. So I'm going to leave that adjustment out for now because it's not going to affect our income statement to make sure that we get through the others. So let's look at adjustment number six. Adjustment number six is an adjustment from the bank statement, and it says that the bank statement for February reflected the following, which have not yet been recorded yet. It says, service fees for 300 Rand and interest on favorable bank account, 60 Rand. So remember, mindsetters, at the end of every month, you get a statement from the bank showing all the transactions that happened in your bank account for that month. And you must then make adjustments for anything that you've not yet recorded. So the first thing here is service fees. You need to know that service fees are always known as bank charges. We don't know how much money the bank charges us for using things like checkbooks, credit cards, ATM deposits, and that sort of thing. But they do charge us money, and on the bank statement, we can see how much was charged to us. Now, in this example, there are service fees of 300 Rand. To do this adjustment is very easy. They are just expenses that haven't been recorded yet. So we're going to go to our income statements, and we're going to find the figure here for bank charges. Here it is, 3,000. This figure is wrong. We need to just take the 3,000 Rand and we've got to add the extra 300 that have not yet been recorded so that the correct answer is actually 3,300. That's very important because we may, must make sure that our income statement reflects the real amounts for February. In the, sorry, for the whole year, not just February. So anything that happened in February must be added. In the same way, what we're going to do is we're going to go to our bank account. Our bank account appears in the general ledger and it appears in the balance sheet section. What we need to know is that if the bank has charged us 300 Rand, all that's going to happen is that our bank is going to be reduced by 300 Rand. And I'm sure you'll know by now that bank appears in the note for cash and cash equivalents. It gets reduced by 300 Rand because we've paid 300 Rand's worth of bank charges. The bank takes that money directly out of our bank account at the end of every month as a charge for using their service. The second part of the adjustment involves interest on a favorable bank account. So if my bank account is favorable, I need to know that that 60 Rand is going to be interest 
that I have actually earned its interest income because it's on a favorable bank balance. So this is going to serve to increase my bank account. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my bank account and add 60. Again, this doesn't happen in the income statement. You do that in the note for cash and cash equivalents. But I must find the corresponding income that matches it. And it's over here, my interest income. My interest income is standing at 2,000 Rand, but that's actually incorrect. It's 2,000 Rand plus an extra 60 Rand's worth of income that I haven't recorded yet, that I just found out now when I got the bank statement. So that's how we do that adjustment. If you look at your next adjustment, this is one that you'll see often. It says the rent for February 2005 has not been paid yet. Provide for the amount owing. So. What we've got in our income statement is an incorrect figure for rent. If we look over here, we've got a figure for rent income. Sorry, rent expense. We've got a figure for rent expense for 44,000 Rand. What we've done is we've paid a person 44,000 Rand for the rent for this year. But it says that we have not yet paid for February. So we've lived in the premises or we've used the premises for our business up to the end of February, but we've actually only paid for every month up to the end of January. So there's one month's rent that's still outstanding. What we need to do is we need to work out what that amount is. This should be clear if you see that this 44,000 is actually for 11 months rent because we haven't paid for 12 months, we've paid for all the rent up to end of January and not February. So if we want to know what one month's rent is, what we do is we take our calculator and we take the 44,000 that we've paid, and we divide it by 11 months, because we've only paid for 11 months. That tells me that my rent is 4,000 Rand per month. But this income statement needs to reflect the rent for the entire year. So what I must do, it should actually show 12 months rent. In other words, I've got to add an extra 4,000 Rand to this rent. So my rent expense wasn't 44,000. It was actually 44,000 plus another 4,000, it should have been 12 months rent instead of 11. And because this rent hasn't been paid yet, it's an expense to us that we haven't paid yet. What we need to do, we need to record its contra entry over here as accrued expenses are going to go up by another 4,000 Rand because we owe 2,000 Rand for this interest on the loan that we did previously. And now an additional 4,000 Rand is going to be for the rent that we still haven't paid. OK, so that's that adjustment. So let's look at the next one. Our next adjustment says, a debtor in Norris complained that she was overcharged on her latest invoice. Peggy agreed to adjust her account by 800 Rand, but this has not been recorded. It does, however, say that the cost of sales was correctly recorded. So this is one of those examples where a debtor has been declared insolvent and um, Oh, sorry, where a debtor has been overcharged, and what we must do is we must take that 800 Rand, and we are actually giving what we call a debtor's allowance. Debtor's allowances. What you need to remember is that when I said right at the beginning of this lesson, I said debtor's allowances are subtracted from sales. So this debtor was overcharged by 800 Rand. We have to subtract the 800 Rand from sales, which I'm going to do now. Go back to my income statement, go to my sales figure here. Sales figure was 600,000, that's actually wrong. Let's cross it out. It should be 600,000 minus 800 Rand because that 800 Rand was an overcharging of a debtor. In the same way, what we're going to do is we're going to go to our debtor's control amount, which appears usually in note number five on trade and other receivables, and we're going to reduce it by 800 Rand because we gave this debtor an allowance. We're not going to make her pay that 800 Rand anymore. Make sure you understand how to do that one because it comes up very often. OK, now if we look at our next one, this one is very, very similar to our challenge question. So I'm going to do this one and then I'm going to answer the challenge question. I think, uh, Pumi, there were some people that answered the challenge question already on the, yes, there on the is. internet. I'm actually um, looking at one from Oba Gang Scan on Global saying, account debited is a bad debt by 240 rands and account credited is a T Majola also by 240. That's, that's exactly the right answer. There's just one little part of that question missing. So okay. I'm going to get, get back to that now. Okay. But let's look at this one. This is the same sort of thing. It says here that a debtor, Efrit, has been declared insolvent. 
Very, very similar to the question about T. Majolo, who's been declared insolvent. He owes us 1,250, and the insolvent estate will pay out 60 cents in the rand. What we do is we do a quick calculation with three, three figures. The first thing is that this debtor is insolvent. So we're going to cancel part of his debt that he's not going to pay. But it says that the insolvent estate will pay out 60 cents in the rand. So we need to calculate how much we receive and how much we write off. The way we do that, if he's paying us 60 cents for every rand that he owes us, what we do is we take the calculator and we take the amount he owes us, which is 1,250, and we multiply it by 0,6 because 0,6 will tell me he's paying me 60 cents for every rand that he owes. So it comes to 750 rand. We're going to receive from him 750 rand. And he owed us originally 1,250. If you subtract the 750 that we're going to receive, that means we have to write off an additional 500 rand. 750 plus 500 gives you the 1,250 that the debtor originally owed. So what we're going to do is we're going to make two entries here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to subtract um, the 1,250 from debtor's control, or in this case, the debtor's name, if fruit. You can do either one. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to add 750 rand to bank, because that is the money that we have received. And the third thing we're going to do is we're going to add 500 rand to bad debts. So those are the three steps in our adjustment. If we have to do it on our income statement, the only item that goes in the income statement here is the 500 Rand. If I go back to my income statement here, what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, create a special account here called bad debts. And in my bad debts, I'm going to put the 500 Rand that I've written off. Uh, same way here in bank, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the 750 that I received. And from debtor's control, I'm going to subtract the 1,250. That's the part that he has to owe us that we've written off, as well as the part that he's paid. Very quickly, let's use this information to answer our challenge question. Our challenge question is very similar to this. Our challenge question said that our debtor was declared insolvent, and he owed us 800 rand. What happened was he paid us 30 cents in the rand. So to calculate what he paid us, he, we're going to take the 800 Rand that he originally owed us, multiply it by 0, 0,3 or 30 cents, 30 over 100. We, he's actually going to pay us 240 Rand. So what's going to happen, because we receive that money from him, we're going to increase bank by 240. We're also going to decrease T Majola or credit T Majola by actually the full amount of 800 Rand because the part that we are not receiving in the bank is the part that we are actually going to write off. So the part that has to be written off is the difference between these two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 800 Rand is what he owed us. He paid us 240. So what that means is that the 560 has to be written off. And what will happen in this case is we will create an extra expense called bad debts, and that will increase by 560 Rand, that's the amount that's written off. So, mindsetters, that is the answer to our challenge question. Um, Pumi, I don't know if I have time to do one more adjustment, otherwise we'll ask the mindsetters to practice it and put the answers up on the internet. Mm, I think that we have to try and yeah, get to the next question. Okay, so let's, let's see if I can finish this last one. Okay, it looks like we've only got 20 seconds left. See okay. if you can do this one. I'll quickly tell you what happens. If you've read it already, what we're going to do it says, commission of 1,500 is owed to Peggy's Fashions for sale of fashion magazines. This will be received in March 2005. So this 1,500, we still have to receive. That's actually quite easy. We need to know that that's accrued income. Our adjustment is going to be simple. All we're going to do is we're going to go back to our income statement. It's money that we haven't received yet. We're going to add 1,500 to commission income, and then we're going to go down to our balance sheet, create an account called accrued income, and add 1,500 Rand to that. So my line setters, this is a very essential part of your accounting syllabus. Make sure you practice enough of these that you get good at them. They're going to come up again and again and again. I wish you the best of luck and keep adjusting your balance sheets and income statements. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much, Martin, for today.
Great Thank stuff. you very much. All right, then, Mindset says, this unfortunately all what we have the time for for today. Please make sure that you write all of your exams very well and also represent yourselves and your schools and everybody else that you love at home. But for me, Pumi and Martin, and of course, the Mindset team, it is bye-bye.